we have, we have fun here. Okay. You know, and, and, and this fun resonates yeah. to the community. We love you guys. We appreciate your support. You know, so give yourselves a round of applause. Okay, ready to go? All right. One more time, though. <laughs> hey, my name is Bill Lewis, and I have the pleasure of playing Michael in our production of Good Times. It's my pleasure and extreme honor to introduce the real Michael from Good Times, Mr. Ralph Carter.
Ken Abrams. Hello, everyone. My name is Kenneth Abrams. I'm the president of Towson Black Alumni Alliance. Um, we actually have uh, a gentleman who was the first black professor. He integrated the university. His name was Whitney LeBlanc. And in 1965, he integrated the university. But uh, after that, he wound up starting PBS, started a first black soap opera. And then he actually got a call from Norm Lear. And Norm Lear asked him to be an associate producer for Good Times. And so Bernadette Stannis was generous enough to allow us to have a video so that we could pay tribute to him. Because unfortunately, he passed away February 9th of last year. February 8th is when they celebrated their 50th anniversary. Wow. And so February 9th, we paid tribute to him at Towson. So thank you, Bernadette, for doing this. Please, Generation that probably missed all the programming 
and they got to know what a wonderful character that you established. Oh, thank I you, mean, John. Appreciate that. Being out of high school and, 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 and launching a successful career as a comedian, actress, that's going to show these young people that it can be done. They got to yeah. believe. Amen. So, Amen. Amen. So, thank you for accepting a wonderful example, and I look forward to us working together again and again in the future, guys. Amen. Yes, John. Thank you. I love you. Love you. Love you back. Okay. Oh. America's favorite dad. <laughs>
Her adaptation of Raisin was turned into a Bowie musical of Raisin in the Sun was turned into a musical. It is there that Norman Lear came more than once to see me at the arena stage in Washington, D.C. I am literally the third actor hired for the show after our beloved Esther Rowe and John Amos. I had the job before I had the job. So that Robert Nimmerwall is the husband and was the husband of Lorraine Hansberry. He contracted with Norman Lear to buy me out of my contract from that Broadway production. I'm really grateful also to all of the other young children who were in my peer group. This includes, of course, Mr. Haven Nelson, Mr. Lawrence Fishburne. Wow. Time has allowed us to be lifelong brothers. Our mothers got along, Miss Maxine, my mother, Mrs. Lucille, and also Miss Hattie, who is Lawrence Fishburne's mother. So our mothers got along, so we in turn got along. And again, for all the young people who have come before me that paved the way for a young actors like myself, I constantly pay homage. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And let me just say, I, I saw Ralph in, in Raisin uh, with the Debbie Ralph, De Debbie, Debbie Allen. Allen. And I remember the song Sidewalk Tree. Sidewalk Tree, yes. yes. And you were, you were incredible. Wow. You're still a great singer. Thank you. Yeah. Wow. And I just want my intro, my backstory of all of them. I saw, I met Vern, uh, actually, I was at someone's house. And, uh, Whose house? I can't yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, everybody was there. Everybody was there. <laughs>
drug store on the corner. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Baby, don't mind. You gotta take that uh, property, miss, and get that pen. You gotta take it, get on there. So I got on there, I did my little thing, and I, I knew I had to do it right. It was that Sunday that Amanda came over to my mom and said, we were just looking for a, a, a sister for a show. Um, they didn't have the name of the show, but a sister for a, a new pilot that's coming out, and um, I'd like her to audition if that's okay with you. So my mother took the card, and the next week we went up, and we um, went into the room where the audition was. There were as many girls as you guys did in here. <laughs> I'm like, all right, <laughs> but so, anyway, I can't remember my father said, what's for you is for you, and nobody can take a bed from you, right? So I kept saying that to myself, it's for you, for you, yeah. Anyway, so I go into the room, and there was Jimmy Walker. Dumb <laughs> hat. He had a hat on then. And it was Norman Leah with his white dumb hat on. <laughs> and so we had to improvise. So but we improvised because the script was really not what a teenage black girl would say. It was written by some older white man, I guess. Anyway, I said, can we improvise? So they looked at me like, oh God, please, we got a lot of people to go through today in Paris. Go ahead. <laughs> so Jimmy and I started improvising. I started with him, and Jimmy's looking at me like, what the heck? And I'm stuck about carrying on. You remember it, Jimmy? Okay. No, <laughs> <laughs> I didn't remember it. So anyway, I started carrying on with him. And so what I did, he did something. I said, you better take out the garbage. You better do something for mommy. And I pushed him like I'm doing right now. Anyway, he looked at me the same way he's looking at me now, and we started saying stuff, and Norman started laughing. I don't know if that did it, but it maybe it got close. So a month later, I heard from them to go to California. And we started laughing. That's, that's how obvious your talent was. The Norman started laughing. The master of situation I mean, started laughing at you and, and your improvisation. That's genius. <laughs> Thank you. It was four girls, and then um, we stayed for a week or two. And after that, I don't know who picked me. Maybe it was Alan Mays or Jimmy Walker <laughs> or no <Norman Taylor. laughs> But whoever. And anyway, I got the call that I was Thelma. Oh. That's how I got it. Black Panthers and the Last Poets. 
Oh yeah, look at the last boys, Felipe Luciano, David Nelson, Galan, all those cats, man. We had the and Stokely called Michael he used to always say to me, I was Stokely was a big back to Africa movement, right? That was a big deal going back to Africa. And I said to Stokely all the time, you know, Stokely, there's a lot of white people who would love this back to Africa movement. <laughs> <laughs> and he would always say to me, man, you're just not relevant to the movement. You're not here. So we had Nikki Giovanni and Sonia Sanchez and all these people. So I was uh, the comedic thing. I would do five minutes, and then I did I did the '68 riots, whatever. We did that with, with with Jesse Jackson and all those guys. So I worked on those things as a comedian. And so I did that, and I went to do the warm ups. And luckily, I was able to garner a few laughs in there. So I did some laughs, and the guys who were producing the show, because they had a great cast. I mean, they had Jose Perez and, uh, and some other people. Great, great cast. I don't know why the show didn't make it, but it's a great show. And the show, it could be done now. It's about an unemployment office and just the crazy people that come into the unemployment office. And I just said, what a great show. And they had all sorts of Hispanics and blacks and Asians coming in asking for stuff. And these guys, were, Candy Azar was in the show, a lot of good people. So I would do the warm-ups and, and the producers came to me and said, man, you're funnier than our show. Mm -hmm. He said, we got to tone that down. You're funny. So then Pat Kirkland came in, and she was casting director for Norman Lear. She said, you know, we've seen you twice. We're doing this show. Would you like to be on the show? Now, in this business, this is just the way it goes, especially in the stand-up business. People are liars. <laughs> and they lie, and they say they know you, they this, they that. You have no idea who these people are, and they come up. So I said, yeah, I'll do it. Let me know. Because I thought she was lying. And she said, no, 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 we really want you to do this. So, okay. I came back the next week, and Norman Lear was there. She said, hey, this is Norman Lear. I go, yeah, I didn't know Norman Lear because I was in clubs all the time. So I never saw any of the shows because we were club guys. Me, Brenner, Freddie Prince, Bette Midler, Andy Kaufman. We were all, that's all we did was do comedy all night starting from like six in the morning to probably four in the morning. That, that's all we did, every night. 10 minutes a piece, champagne gallery, the improv, it catch right, you start, the afternoon room. We would just walk to places and do comedy, street comedy, everything. We had this guy, Charlie Barnett, who was actually a movie. Actually a movie should be done by Charlie Barnett. Charlie Barnett, I'm just gonna jump off for a minute, was a guy who was born in Kansas City, he was dumped by his mom, okay? His mom put him on a train in a box, okay? And the box went to New York. And people took him off the box and put him in Greenwich Village and he raised himself from the time he was like two or three years old and did comedy in the village. Street comedy, which is the hardest thing. Just set up a blanket and start talking. And unfortunately, he was working at the Apollo while he was still in diapers. Yeah, he was great. He was a musician. He was great. He was great. But unfortunately, he had a drug habit. He was a crazy guy. Tons and tons of women. Women love guys like that. Just <laughs> drunk and on drugs. And, but he was just a great comic. Now, here's what actually happened. The people who sat here in line saw him. And they wanted to use him. So they brought him in, and he improv all of his stuff. Now they say, you're cast, you're gonna do the show. But on the show, you have to read cards to do things. He had never gone to school. He did not know how to read. Therefore, Eddie Murphy was hanging out. They gave it to Eddie Murphy. Wow. Okay? We should give it to you, Jimmy. <laughs> no, 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 I know. Well, Lord, Lord Michael's not a Jimmy Walker fan, but that's okay. <laughs> but, but, and then what happened to him is the people from Miami Vice saw him, and they said, we don't care if you can't read. We'll tell you what the lines are and your improv. But then, unfortunately, through his use of needles and everything, you got HIV to die. Mm -hmm. But I think this, to me, is a great movie. But anyway, back to my hey, life. Jimmy, <laughs> I'm so glad to see you on it, Jimmy. I'm so glad to see you on the tube again, even as, in, in this capacity. <laughs> <laughs> Where Jimmy Walker can make his presence known, 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, my mic and I'm having difficulties here. We will join you, Bernadette, in cast of Good Times for the 50th viewing when we get our problems rectified here. These technical problems. Right now, we got to bow up. Okay. Thank you, John. said to me, we wanted, so I met Norman Lear, and Norman Lear saw me, I think it's only the second time he ever, he only saw me twice as a stand-up, he never, he came to Vegas when I was opening for Tina Turner, and, uh, oh, I opened, like, please, if you go to Philadelphia, you'll see how, I have, I'm on the Soul Jam show, which is a stylistic self I don't know his wow. notes, Eddie Holman, all these cats, Shy Lights, Eddie Prince, uh, Prince, Prince I worked with twice, which is Wait, a very yeah. tough experience. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, my tough experience with Peter Frampton, but that's another thing, 16,000. That was a tough gig for Jimmy Walker. But anyway, no, then I worked with, we did, a thousand years ago, we did the Cool Jazz Festival, which is Aretha Franklin, Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder. And the funniest, I just told a funny story about that, Johnny Taylor, who had, who's making love to your old lady, and, uh, the disco lady. Johnny Taylor had a huge, because I worked tons of R&D shows when I was a house MC at the Apollo for a long time. And you had the Uptown in, in uh, Philadelphia work there. Oh, yeah. And so, <laughs> Johnny Taylor had a massive, massive drinking problem. <laughs> so he would miss shows, he would come on drunk, and the show was so powerful that we worked better in stadium here in Philadelphia. And uh, they said to Johnny, they said, hey Johnny, this is it, man. We can't have any more missing shows. We can't have any more going on drunk. We can't have any more of this. You're running over time. It's costing us money. One more thing, and you're done. We said, all right, all right, all right. I'll make it. So we're in Cincinnati, and none of the acts would do PR. Most acts hate doing PR. They don't like to do it. They don't like to be on anything, whatever. So I, because I was the MC, I had to do it. So I did it, and we were sitting at second base at Riverfront Stadium, and, it, and, and I'm sitting there, and we're at second base during the day, the press is there. And all of a sudden, here comes Johnny Taylor from the dugout. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like noon, and Johnny Taylor's got on a maroon, uh, uh, royal blue suit, he's got a derby, he's got an a anti-shake case, and he comes to second base, he said, hey man, I learned my lesson. I'm gonna make every show from now on, I'm not gonna miss one mm -hmm. show. And the stage man says, very good, Johnny, but the show is tomorrow. <laughs> I will never forget that. <laughs> Completely out of line. Go, Come on, Johnny. So anyway, when I was doing this thing for Pat Kirkland and everybody, uh, I, I said, look, uh, you know, give me a call, let me know what's happening. And I didn't even give them my number because I didn't believe them because everybody lies. Me and Freddie Prince used to do a lot of what we call uh, road shows. That's like three or four o'clock in the morning. And we go to these places and we do whatever. And wait a minute, somebody's injured, we don't like that. Are they carrying people out of here? Is it too much here? What's going on? Oh, oh they got it. They got it. All right, help her out. Oh my goodness, sorry you're missing it, and we're glad that you made an effort to get you Give her a hand. So anyway, I gave them the address of the improv. They said, we'll call you at the improv. So Louis the Cook was there, and Louis, we used to get mail, me and Brenner and Beth, and, and everybody, we would always get our mail at the improv, okay? So Louis comes up to me, the cook, and he says, hey man, You've got like five letters here. I want you to take these letters and get the hell out. So I took a letter and it was from the Norman Lear people. And they had a contract. And I said, oh, okay. So there was a guy who was a lawyer, Kenny the Drunk, we call him. <laughs> and I said, hey, Kenny, what is this? He said, it looks like a contract or something. He says, I said, is it any good? He said, go up to the office. I'll look at it. So I give him the order, he said, it's good, sign it. So then Edmonds and Curly again got me these gigs 
in North and South Dakota. We did like 60 gigs, which you had to kind of go on and kind of audition for. And I did these things for colleges, and I won what they call the block booking of it. I got second place. That year, the first place for prize went to BBT. No. And I got like 60 dates. BB King got 125 dates from these colleges. Oh, and so I'm doing these dates with this guy, Michael J. Smith, who had a record called Blue and Blue, Sand and Sad, You're the Best Thing I've Ever Had. That was a big song. So we're doing some neuters, and I get called from J.D. Joe, who's Norman Lear's secretary. And I said, yes. He says, I'm from Norman Lear's office. You know, you're supposed to be in Los Angeles. I said, why? He said, because you signed up for this show. And I said, what show? <laughs> yeah, so I had no idea what show she was talking about because I had my dates. I was very happy. I had dates back east and had dates here with your guy, Senator Coons, all these cats. I had dates here, Delaware State, all this, wow. whatever. We worked a ton of dates here. But we did corporates here. And that's why I know the area so well. We worked a lot here. And because I'm not an urban act, this was not an urban show. But anyway, so that's, you know, I don't have that crowd. I don't have the urban crowd. That's what Epps and, 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 and uh, Cat Williams and those guys. They have you guys. I don't work those things. I don't have that kind of language. I always say this when I do show that the black people are the most hypocritical comedy audience in the world. Because they're the first ones to say, we believe in God. <laughs> church, but you go Friday night, Saturday night, Cat Williams, Michael F. Samore, listen to that. And they're there jumping up and down and their heads are exploding. <laughs> <laughs>
where are you? He said, go across the street, man. They're waiting for you. So I went over there and I started reading the script and that was it.
stood up and applauded outside. And she started crying because she had a car. And we had very little parking at the store. But Mitzi said, you know what? I'm going to give you your own parking space. No. And she got her own parking space. Now, she got on your show, all right? And I begged Norman to please use her. She got the show. She came into our little rehearsal hall. And she fell into my arms and started crying. She could not believe she got it. And I would see her all the time. She says, thank you so much. And I said, don't thank me because you're great on the show. And this is one thing that she said was funny. Because when you show us first saw him getting names and everything, she said, I want to be called Shirley on the show. Because she said, I see the, this is Shirley's words, not me. She said, I see the way they treat your ass when they call you JJ. I want my name to be whatever they're going to call me when they see me. <laughs> Okay, 
Because all I do is want to keep that woman alive. When you have somebody's life in your hands, you think about that all the time. I gotta keep this person alive. I gotta do the right thing, okay? So I let me go a little bit, and a lot of times caregivers pass away before the person they cared for. Unfortunately, or fortunately, I didn't. But I remember gaining a lot of weight. A lot of weight. I mean, I, I didn't notice it, okay? Because I wasn't focused on myself. So I remember going and I had to buy clothes because my clothes was not fitting right and everything. They started buying new clothes. And I remember going to the store one time and saying, why are they always ordering these European clothes? <laughs> Black people can't wear this. But I was, you know, in my but two, di two digits. You know, tell you how far. Two digits. But I'm just saying, as a caregiver, not quite that. <laughs> As a, <laughs> over there. Um, as a caregiver, take time for yourself. You know, go to the gym. Make sure you take care of your health. Because, you know, a lot of times we don't make it through. Okay? And it takes us a long time sometimes to get back. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. I have to take care of my mother. Uh, and her, it switched that last year when she was bedridden, and Barry told me that, like, give, give yourself time. It's okay to be frustrated sometimes, you know, so, oh, well, you know, I, 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 it's really, that calls you about It's it. wonderful because um, I was able to, you know, help people that are going through that. Mine went first. Mm -hmm. But I remember one night, um, I got a text from Ernie, and I knew what he meant. Mm -hmm. He was at the, at the end, he was at the last. And I could feel it, and it was about two in the morning. And I wrote him something, I can't remember word for word, but I said, Ernie, it's okay. Let her speak about the things she wants to speak about. She's gonna go back 20, 30 years, but go back there with her, because that's where she is. Let her listen to the music she listened to then. You know, she's thinking about all the beauty. God has taken away the ugly. And he's giving her yeah. all the beauty now. Yeah. That was the part. That all the, all the ugly. Yeah. And gave her all the beauty. And she was so happy to listen to her music. And, and talk about her ex, 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 ex boyfriends. Or whoever. You know, but those were her happy times. And I said, Ernie, this is her time. This is her time, Ernie. Go with her. Go with her. Yeah. Thank you. Go with her. Also, I had to raise myself because I had been in the trenches with my mother for so long. She always kept me in the kitchen. I said, Mom, why you got me cooking all the time? She said, Ralph, so you won't starve. No. And along with that, she taught me how to bake and do all of the things necessary to stay on the planet. Jabbar, we'd like to take the time to thank you and to the wonderful staff for the security. Thank you for making us feel welcome. When we came here, we thank you, thank you. And before my mother left, my mother said, Ralph, always remember one thing, act as if no one's coming to your rescue. Mm. Therefore, you are responsible for your own life. And that the only opinion about you, Ralph, that matters is your own. Oh, yeah. Everybody has opinions, right? They all have no So my only opinion of me that matters is my own. Amen. Take care. Before that, I just want to crucify my ego. I forgot to give up to my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Now we're going to have a Q&A. Uh, so you all can ask your, beautiful, your, your questions you've been uh, yearning to do. So I work here, so I get to ask the first question. <laughs> Created good times. He came out. A video went viral of him alleging that Norman Lear had stolen many of his ideas for Sanford and Son. What's happening? What are your What are your thoughts on those claims? Well, I, I, well, I know. Yeah, he should definitely get get the credit, like Ralph and Sanford. In good times. I know for what's happening for sure. That was Cooley High. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing I can't speak to. Uh, I know he feels that way. He said he all those shows have sold him. I, I can't speak to it as whether it was true or not. Anyone else? No. No opinion. But I do know he was a, he was a great, um, great, writer. great writer. Great writer. Still is. Yes, he yeah. has great concepts. 
Yeah. You know, so he did contribute to a lot of, of our earlier shows. He did do that. And we love Pooley High, the good movie, right? Yeah. <laughs> Just like we never stopped loving each other. And I think because of that, it has kept us together as a team. And 
I, I just admired that she was only 10. Mm. <laughs> I thought that was beautiful. And her mother was so beautiful too. Yes. Mm. Well, you had two. You her first. And then you. Go ahead. Hi. Um, well, I wanted to start off first with an introduction. So God to introduce you all said, this is the opportunity to give you all flowers. So I just wanted to take time out. I'm 29 years old and I literally grew up on you all. And the impact that everyone keeps saying, like seeing John, I literally cried because like from uh, Good Times, Kuta Kente, him, our Fresh Prince, coming to America, like, et cetera. Like you all are truly, truly legends. So I just wanted to take time out to acknowledge you all before I ask my question. Thank you, thank you. Uh, so first, again, impact legacy. When you all think of yourselves as pioneers in black television, and then individually, and then also the show Good Times, what do you all want Good Times to be remembered as? Very quick, good question. I, I know I would like to see it go on for many years. I know it probably will go on way after we're gone, but it opened up the world to see what a black family in love with a mommy and a daddy, and although we were poor, we were struggling, we were staying together. And that helps a lot of families to know that you don't give up so easy. You fight for your children. You know? and, and being the first black female teenager ever on television, mm -hmm. that, was a, that was something for me. But being born and raised in Brooklyn, in Brownsville, in the projects, I fashioned that character a lot like the way I was because my parents were strict and they, they knew what outside of that was, so they tried to raise us in a certain way. And like my brother always says, I think you were born to be Thelma. <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, okay, whatever. But I'm just saying, <laughs> you did say that to me one day. But I'm just saying that I would like to see the show all teach and help and do the best that it can. And it also opened up the world to people who didn't understand who black people were. Right. Yeah. 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 Okay, and, and I, get, I get a lot of emails from, from Caucasian men who tell me, thank you, I'm married to a black woman today. These guys came to the improv, 
and they said we want to they want to see me work so they saw me work they said you're great we're going to use you in, in these two movies that i did and so i get to the thing to go and they go god you're just not black enough mm. you know whatever you got to be blacker so i said oh let me go to the subway because we had uh, mm -hmm. they had stores down the subway i said let me get this hat. Maybe this will make me look blacker. <laughs> so I got the hat and I got the parts in the two movies. <laughs> <laughs> I got those hats. Because I said it's a black hat. So I put it black. <laughs> and then everybody started buying the hats and I was not involved in that part of it. But that's that's what happened. So that 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 was Bernadette. Mm -hmm. She always came through for me with that. <laughs> Flowers and women hate flowers. They hate you to say they're pretty. They well, you know what? I'm gonna share something. Now, I'll, go ahead. Talk. Just, I'm gonna tell. Go ahead. I'm gonna tell. <laughs> when we first got on the show, I went back there, Jimmy. When we first got on the show. Jimmy said, "Well, you know, I don't have a lot of dates, and I don't know. So, what should I do? You know, what should I get a girl? What should I do?" I said, "Well, first of all, you, you should buy her jewelry." I said, "You should buy her some jewelry." So Jimmy said, "Oh, okay." So he goes over to Farmer's Market, which is right across the street, and he buys a very nice piece of jewelry, but the thing was this big, and it was turquoise. I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, I said, Jimmy, is she a giant? So wait a minute. I said, no, Jimmy, go back, take that back, and go get a fine jewelry. And to this day, all his girlfriends love him because he always buys them jewelry. Wow. to give to us in the industry to 
keep doing what you guys are doing. Well, for me, I would say to you, you can't be thin-skinned. That's what Esther used to teach us. Because you will get hurt if you are thin-skinned. Because nobody really cares how you feel. And, um, and they say harsh things to you. So you have to believe in yourself and know no matter what they say, you have to believe in yourself and you have to know your talent. Okay, and the business is, 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 no, is no fun, it's work. And you have to know your stuff, that's what I would say. As I claim to earth and the ground that I walk, I'm also grateful for the men and women who I have met who constantly tell me that because of the work that I did do, they became extremely interested in African American history and global history. So that as a testimony to my experience, I think that's one of the greatest contributions that I have received from people that they have. He is so well read. I mean, his whole house is full of books. No, Jimmy has a memory. Jimmy, I've never seen Jimmy oh, walk oh, without. I must say this. I must say Always. This. It's true. Well, I must say this. I'm happy to give him his flowers. Because he's always been so well read. And I'm not saying that he doesn't know how to do it. We all make a mistake every once in a while. But he never did. Jimmy, it was a fantastic example for me to watch a man who was that professional, always on time. Jimmy could be away for the whole weekend, but he would come in and know his stuff. So I said, well, wow, I, like the, I like the protocol that he has because maybe I can apply that to what I want to so do as an artist. He was a well. good big brother. Yeah, he was really good. Yeah. Lavetta Thompson, and I'm here representing Baltimore, Maryland. Right now. Yes. I want you all to know that I love your show so much that no matter what episode come up, I can tell you what season it's from. Oh my God. <laughs> Here's my question. Okay. When John Amos was killed off the show, and when you all had to do that first episode with the funeral, were you all really affected when he was gone and he was no longer a part? Because it really bothered me. I was upset and I cried. And I cried every time I see that scene. So how did you all feel? How were you affected when they took him away? I, I, I was devastated. I was extremely devastated because I had known John, as I mentioned before, in my Broadway years. We worked together in a wonderful play called Tough to Get Help. It was directed by Carl Reiner. And believe me, the plate needed help to close the night after it all. <laughs> so <laughs> you learn, you learn, you have some hits and you have some misses. But um, that particular summer, I really processed going back to work that year. You know, it wasn't about the monetary thing so much as the fact that he was such a great man to work with. So that when you're a young man, because my, my father and John Davis, they were both Capricorn. So they got along like peas in a pod. So I had the best of both worlds, just as my major educators have all been Capricorn people. But I say that because Bernadette is a wonderful Capricorn woman. Jimmy birthday is in Cancerian season. So I also love the beautiful chemistry that John Amos and Esther had. If you notice the dynamics of their love affair, it was very, the chemistry was really very beautiful. So that you can have an African-American complete family unit especially living in a culture where our families were just separated and kidnapped and sold from this place to that place, you know, never to see each other again. So we as a people, we, we've all been wounded in this culture mm -hmm. and we're still in repair now. Mm -hmm. yes. So may you continue to heal yourself from within and also be a conduit for other people to help heal themselves too. But do you first, that's not selfish. Right. Take care of yourself first, and you can help other people. Yes, absolutely. Well, for, for me, for me, finding out that John was leaving the show was devastating too, because we, we came to table read, and I had no concept. Um, after the show was over, and they said he had died, I'm looking for part two. Okay, you know, mistaken identity or something, and they said no, he's gone, and that was very devastating for me. Because it, it was just like, you know, a, like a death, a real death. Like somebody just jumps out of your life. So it, it hurt me a lot because John, John didn't mean a lot to the show. 
and, she, and I'm about to ask you. This is our last question. Okay. I'm closing out the uh, show. <laughs> yeah, you closing it out, brother. Uh, how you doing? My name is John Williams. I grew up outside of Philadelphia, PA. Okay, so hey, first, how you doing? So first, I want to say, you know, I, I thank you for coming out, taking away some time out of your busy lives to engage in this fruitful conversation. At the same time, I thank you for uh, portraying the characters in the way that you did to the magnitude that affected all of our lives here, and many more, obviously. Thank you. So uh, my question is, Mr. Jimmy Walker, or JJ, if I can call you that. Um, what happened to all those paintings in the, in the living room? Yeah. 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 I, I had nothing to do with the painting. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't did. earn any bonds painted all of those paintings. the show that Jimmy was the painter because so many people became painters, you know, taking after Jimmy. <laughs> but the funny part about it is that there was a show where you could do what you were doing on the show, and so Jimmy was a painter on the show. So Jimmy had to paint a painting. And Jimmy was gonna throw that thing in the garbage. <laughs> Because they're here, you got this one-time opportunity 
to get that. And I, I remember going to uh, one autograph signing, and Batman, the guy who did Batman, his autograph was $100. And I remember the other, what's the Star Trek? His was 300 and some dollars. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, who's the Yeah, and, yeah. and I know you guys, as Jimmy said, y'all pay for all the mic gaps and all that. Yeah. But this, this is a clean show that did, we can't even speak of what it did for our culture and for the world. Amen? So this is what we're offering for the 50th anniversary. For $125, you get the group pic, group picture, you get the book, you get a picture with all the celebrity guests, and you get a signed eight by ten of the Good Times cast, and one picture from yours truly. For $100, you get the Good Times, all the, this is all the Good Times people, the book, the picture with all three Good Times cast members, and a signed eight by ten uh, cast pic. For $60, you get the book, Last Life of Bernard and Stannis, a picture with one celebrity of your choice, and a signed 8 by 10 by that celebrity. And if you want the book only, that's 30 bucks, $30. But you get an autograph too. So for 50 years, really, I mean, yeah, that's really it's, it's, you can't even, it's priceless, mm -hmm. you know. So, but I, I want you to know that it's our blood from the demand I have from asking people online. I had a bunch of questions I gave an ask them. Like, so many people responded. But the whole thing was to get a piece of, I can't tell you that people, I want this, is an autograph, is it a book, is a piece of shirt, or a hat, whatever you want. So this is your opportunity. So that's what we'll do right after uh, we hope we're closing now. Yes, we're, we're closing now, so I'd like to ask everybody to keep their seats. We're gonna allow the cast to exit the stage. And if you want to engage them further, um, those activities will be in the room facing forward, the reference department. So let's have the cast exit the stage, and if you all could just keep your seats and keep, keep your eyes clear. Woo!